All right, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Jacek. Uh, with me on stage here, Boris. We're both part of the research team at Status. Uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the communication protocol that we use a lot for chat and so on. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what Status is. I don't know how many here know about Status, uh, more or less, right? It's kind of like this chat application, like Messenger, right? Like almost like WhatsApp, what owned by Facebook and all that. <laughs> Um, no, so status is, is, is a messenger, but it's also meant to be more, it's, it's like a gateway to, uh, to the Ethereum world, uh, meant to be used on mobiles and other resource uh, restricted devices. So what we're trying to achieve is sort of bring this beautiful world of Ethereum with, with, with blockchain, with Swarm, with messaging as, as done in Whisper to the masses, right? So trying to sort of adapt it to what normal people would use in their everyday life. And that might include chatting with each other, but it might also include interacting with dApps, uh, making financial transactions, running bots, you know, whatever you might think of as useful in the Web3 world, except that you're running on a phone, right? And that comes with some uh, come, comes with some unique constraints, let's put it this way. Um, so, I wanted to talk a little bit as well about how we came here. Uh, I know yesterday we had a great dinner, I've had a great time throughout all the talks, so I'd like to thank you all for it. Uh, and, and one question that I got asked was like, what's it like to work at Status, right? And, and, and I, because I just joined, that's all like fresh in my mind. And, uh, so we're a fully distributed company. Um, we're about 70, 80 people now, I guess, growing pretty expand, uh, extensively. Uh, distributed company or work from home company means that all of us are spread out over, all over the world. Like I'm in Singapore, this guy is in Moscow, there's like a big bunch in Berlin, a couple in the States, uh, in Brazil, it, it's like spread all, all over the place which comes with some unique challenges as well, but it's, it's just an interesting place to be. Um, and why would anybody want to join a company like that, right? It's, it's kind of weird, like, with all the ICO scams going on and so on. Um, something in particular must have struck a particular note with, with, with the people here, right? And, and for me personally, this journey kind of started in, in the early 2000s. Um, being in Sweden at that time, was pretty interesting. The whole the Pirate Bay debacle was going down. There was a lot of um, enthusiasm about peer-to-peer -peer networking, about information wanting to be free, about all, how to how to build a different digital world, right? Out of the pieces that we had back then, which were much much more primitive than they are today. Um, so just a quick straw poll here, like who knows of Napster, like who's used Napster, sorry, not knows of Napster, used Napster. <laughs> All right, a good, good, good bunch, right? Um, direct connect, a little bit less. Still peer-to-peer, -peer, right, these, these technologies? They, uh, like basically they changed the model from, from, from there being a server like, like FTP or IRC or whatever to enable you to transfer files directly between peers, and this was like a great thing. Um, the other great thing that went down back then was, was the Cord paper, um, which was like the start of distributed hash tables, you could say, and then later on, Kademlia came on top of that, right? And, and that was a, like this beautiful revelation, right? That, that in logarithmic time, you could reach any computer out there, basically. Um, and it married two fairly simple concepts, right? It married um, connecting to a few peers where all the peers have equal responsibilities together with binary search. It's like, if you look back at it now, it's so trivial if you explain it that way, right? But, but back then it was really cool because all we had was like, you know, star formations of distributed systems and maybe these peer-to-peer -peer systems, but they were incredibly inefficient in all, in all kinds of manners and ways, right? 
Um, after that came BitTorrent, and that was, that was like another big revelation, right? They put, they put an incentivization layer on top of that peer-to-peer -peer, um, system, so away with private forums and sort of having to prove that you're uploading, and suddenly it was just in your interest to, to, to provide the same data as you were. Um, uh, as you were interested in. Uh, obviously very limited in scope, in, 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 it was very specific, like you're interested in this file, you get this file back and that's it, right? Um, and after that was a little bit of a lull in the in the peer-to-peer -peer space. What happened was cloud computing and all that stuff. Um, sure, interesting, but, but not so interesting for me in particular. Why I'm mentioning all this is that all these technologies, they were made what, 15 years ago? And today we're seeing an explosion again in, in, in interest in how these technologies that were developed back then, how they can be combined today with new things, new ideas, and to build something yet more interesting, right? And solve some of these problems that we were unable to solve back then. Um, so that got me thinking, right, that um, the stuff that we're working on today, it's also kind of base layer. It's also very low in the stack. Like Ethereum, that's like general payments, and then on top of that, people build all kinds of fantastic dApps and, 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 and use it for, for, for their own purpose. Same thing with something like Swarm. That's, in many ways, that's kind of like a generalization of, of BitTorrent, if you think about it. Like, you, you, you can dump files in there, and you can get some kind of reward for it. And um, instead of bartering file for file, you introduce like an economic money concept which sort of uh, decouples one thing from the other, right? Um, and what I imagine is that the technologies that we do today, right, in 20 years from now, they're going to be combined with something else and bring yet more interesting ideas to the world. Um, and what, where does that put me? That puts me in a spot where I have a great responsibility to put stuff out there that's good, that makes sense, that, that promotes the right things. And in my case, I believe that decentralization is, is, is in general better than centralization, right? So um, that's how I come into this space. And that's, that's kind of thinking that goes into my, in, around in my head, like, am I doing something useful? Because the stuff that I'm doing now, it's probably going to be useful in 20 years from now, hopefully, right? That's my great assumption here. Um, even if my contribution is tiny, tiny, tiny like this, um, it's still a contribution, right? And, and I have to make a choice. What am, I, what am I going to contribute to? Am I going to contribute to yet another centralized service? Am I going to contribute to something which is, I don't know, used for, say, military purposes or whatever it might be? Um, or am I going to promote something which, or work on something which promotes sane behavior? Um, and that leads us into our topic, right, which is about Whisper. And I'm soon going to leave the mic over to Boris here, who's going to give you a great talk on, on like the technical details of it. But Whisper is one more of those technologies that I feel good about working on. It, it increases privacy in the world. It, it, it gives people an opportunity to communicate uh, with the people that they want to, excluding the people that they don't want to. It, promotes a world where, where censorship becomes more difficult. Um, at the same time, it's terribly inefficient, so that's something we just need to fix, right? But, but, but these underlying ideals, ideals are the underlying ideals that built the internet once upon a time, right? Where every node would be equal and you would be sending on bits to the guy next door and hoping that eventually they would get there. Um, and Whisper is very, very similar in this aspect. It's, it's yet another of those technologies that allows this unrestricted communication between people and without any central point of failure. All right, Boris. Um, hello? I'm talking about... Hello? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, so what is Whisper? Whisper is a uh, uh, sub-protocol of Ethereum. It's... Uh, <clears throat> Close them. Okay. <clears throat> it's a protocol of Ethereum. It allows to achieve 100% uh, of darkness. <clears throat> it's the main property of it. So, 
Uh, why do we do we need Whisper? We suppose that uh, status users uh, uh, need, uh, need uh, Whisper to be more to have more privacy in our world. Uh, <coughs> so. Uh, Whisper is a kind of uh, probabilistic gossip protocol. Uh, we can't understand uh, what messages are interested in by a user because each node uh, receives every Whisper message. So we use Whisper in status for several purposes. Uh, we use it for message exchanging. Uh, for message moderation, and we are going to use for DAP communication. Uh, uh, message. Peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer communication in Whisper network uh, using uh, DAP-2P underlying protocol, and um, uh, it need it don't uh, use blockchain at all. So theoretically. Uh, uh, Whisper could be used to, for all networks uh, and networks ID, and theoretically could be used for all Ethereum forks. Uh, Whisper now, uh, some brief information about Whisper. Whisper I communicate with other Whisper nodes using envelops. envelops. Uh, has uh, uh, message included and some information uh, for communicating between nodes, like POF information and the topic. Uh, message contains uh, message you want to say, send. Uh, filters is used for decrypting uh, the message. So if you receive uh, the message, uh, you try to decrypt it, uh, and uh, you have uh, key to decrypt it. Uh, you could uh, send it to user, but it's not efficient to you uh, to decrypt all messages. Uh, and um, uh, uh, we have topics uh, uh, for. Uh, Understand it which messages we need to decrypt, uh, so it uh, allows to keep balance between privacy and uh, uh, performance. Uh, so uh, collisions in uh, topics. Uh, uh, not only expected they are necessary because uh, uh, we want to achieve uh, darkness. Uh, when we use Whisper v5, we have in our application we have uh, from 10 to 20 gigabytes of data per day. It's too much for mobile application, uh, so we have to migrate to new version of Whisper. It's so Whisper V6, uh, the main goal is trade off between uh, keeping darkness and uh, traffic edition. Uh, Whisper V6 introduces uh, two main concepts it's uh, Bloom filter and Light Node. So when we create new filter, uh, fi uh, topics from the filter add some bytes to Bloom filter. And this blue filter sends uh, uh, to connected whisper peers. So uh, you uh, receive only messages from which matched uh, with this blue filter, and uh, uh, you don't receive uh, unused uh, messages. A second concept is light mode. Uh, you uh, receive messages, but you don't send uh, these um, messages to other connected peer. Uh, 
uh, it allows us to reduce traffic too. Uh, bloom filter has more collision uh, per topic because we want to achieve uh, darkness and uh, it allows us to improve our performance and uh, not share user uh, topics uh, which are interested in. Uh, uh, Whisper has uh, uh, mailbox concept. Uh, so mailbox is a generic Whisper node which collects all Whisper messages. Um, it works as Whisperified uh, a node, but uh, if you miss some messages, like your application was offline uh, or network connection problem, you could request uh, uh, this message uh, from mailbox. Uh, you send. Um, uh, your own bloom filter with uh, topic you are interested in, and you need to say it from and to uh, fields. Uh, it is timestamp, and um, mailbox uh, send this message to you directly. Whisper has two type of messages: it's um, direct Whisper messages uh, and generic Whisper messages, uh, which use Gossip protocol to. Uh, communicate with other peer. Uh, so mailbox interface is pretty simply simple. The current implementation of uh, mailbox uh, is uh, simple. It contains uh, 500 lines of code, but it was good. Uh, so this is an example how Whisper is, message is uh, uh, go through the Whisper network. Uh, for example, Light Node said uh, the message to connect a peer, and from this node it sent to all connect a peer of these nodes. But uh, as you can see that we have some Light Nodes like phones, and they don't send uh, to other nodes the messages. Uh, in our case, um, uh, when I started working in status half a year ago, we had no percent messaging. We have huge network consumption, like uh, 10, 20 gigabytes per day, uh, and uh, the user usage is high. So after the, uh, the changes, uh, we dropped uh, CPU usage to 10, 20 gigabytes per day. Uh, we reduce uh, the usage uh, twice, and we have persistent messaging. Uh, so, I think he has said about next steps. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Boris. Excellent overview. Uh, we still have some problems to solve with Whisper, obviously. <clears throat> and this is a topic of ongoing research, right? So. Um, when we look at Whisper, obviously we're using it for a particular purpose. It might be messaging, and as Boris mentioned, it might be apps talking to each other, it might be um, group chat and so on. Um, and all that happens, a lot of that stuff happens in the application layer, like how do you encode a payload for, uh, for Whisper messages? How can we promote interoperability with other users of Whisper? or other transports underneath, like maybe PSS in the future, right? So <clears throat> a lot of the things that we'll be looking on in the future will be like the security properties of the application layer. And, and for chat, chat in particular, that might be the privacy properties that you gain by using certain protocols, such as double ratchets and, and, and these key exchanges, and, and uh, whether you get forward secrecy or not, what kind of anonymity you offer or not. What kind of guarantees can you give the user? Do you give the user a sliding scale of privacy, or do you just give them like one option? Uh, and, and, and obviously, these are, these are areas that we're looking to cooperate with the community eventually, right? Because it's a messaging app. It doesn't make sense to build a messaging app in a vacuum, right? It needs to communicate with other people. 
Yeah, and there's a lot of them, right? But, but but I don't mind there being a lot of messaging apps, but it's nice if they can talk to each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Because messaging apps should talk to each other. Yeah, exactly, right? Well, of course they have tried, and we're going to make another try, because now, now we're right. <laughs> no, but these are like areas that we're interested in, 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 in furthering, right, and in, in, in seeking some kind of cooperation with, with the wider communi community, because the problems that we'll be solving in the application layer are going to be seen everywhere. Like, we need to exchange contacts, we need to exchange messages, we need to exchange keys, we need to do all these operations just like everybody else, right? So. Um, there, this is like one of the three areas that we're looking at to, to, to improve on, on top of what we're doing today, right? So application layer is the first one. Um, as far as the protocol itself goes, Whisper, right? Um, obviously, being a mobile client, we're always interested in bandwidth management of all kinds of shapes and forms. Um, the work that we managed to do between V5 and V6 was great, right? But then as the number of users grows, uh, we might want to make sure that that decreases even further. Uh, one thing that is a little bit worrisome with all these Ethereum protocols is that their lifespan so far has been pretty short. Uh, and Whisper being sort of the bastard stepchild of, of Ethereum a little bit, uh, hasn't received any attention. And, and because it hasn't received that much attention, it hasn't received much analysis either from a security point of view. Like, how do you break it? If you think about Tor, when it came out, when it came out, right, onion routing, everybody was happy because, like, oh, wow, finally we can get anonymity. And then, then it turned out that if you were able to control X percent of the nodes around the guy, you could figure out pretty much anything. And then a few years later, they noticed that, all right, maybe it's not even that many percentage of nodes, but you can, you can dox people pretty nicely. Um, and this kind of security analysis, like I've, I've searched and scoured the web for, for anything related to how to break Whisper, and, and it's really hard to find. And, and I guess that defines uh, Swarm at this stage as well, because it doesn't even exist, right? And PSS and so on. Like, how well battle-tested are these protocols? Yeah? They actually published it as a proceeding of privacy, so then it all came out next, and they were very well founded for all things like that. You didn't publish it in some peer review. <laughs> yeah, indeed, right? We, we could do that. But like, I'm talking about this stuff because this is stuff that we have on our horizon. This is stuff that we want to happen for Whisper and really for these other protocols that, that, that are being used in this context, right? It, it, it's very, very important for us as a messenger uh, to, make, to, to make use of technologies that really work, right? And, and, and if they break, like, be public about it and open and sort of find a way to fix it. So. Uh, Last one, classic documentation, education, like on Whisper, there's practically nothing. I'm very happy that, uh, Aaron, where are you? There, <laughs> right? Uh, showed me a nice documentation side of, of, of Swarm yesterday. I'm very happy to see that it exists. Uh, on Whisper, that doesn't really exist, so <coughs> there's more work to do there as well. Um, the final point is decentralization, like, um, Boris mentioned the mail server trust issue itself, like we have to contact a particular mail server right now with the protocol as it is. It creates a single point of failure, it creates a single point of trust. Um, never good, right? Uh, another issue we're looking at is like Whisper itself, it uses proof of work as a spam filter basically. And that's fine when, when, when all the nodes on the network are entirely homogenous, like when they have the same computing power. Uh, for our case, a mobile phone, uh, not quite the case. We don't want to burn battery just to like, like send an emoji to somebody. So that's also something that we're trying to sort of figure out how to do. And um, a big area of our ongoing research is like incentivization models, like where maybe you pay for a service to somebody that provides it, or um, like the other light clients work that um, you you have the possibility to pay for better service at some point, and those might be. Uh, interesting things to explore in the future. You, uh, you had something? Yeah, so I was going to ask you, you talked about the performance challenges with Whisper. It seems like there's this, this inherent, uh, an inherent conflict between the desire for 
anonymity and surveillance resistant resistance and performance to some degree, right? I was just curious to hear what things you could do to improve performance without sacrificing some of the reasons Whisper was created in the first place. Yeah, so like you say, it's, it, it, it tends to be a trade-off. Uh, why I'm optimistic is because there has been improvements on this front over time, right? So if I look back at the situation in, 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 in the early 2000s, forward secrecy didn't quite exist, right? And, and today it exists as a technology because somebody had a bright idea. Um, that strictly improves security and at basically no cost, um, as, a, as each new technology does, right? Uh, I was reading a secure messaging paper the other day and it increases, it, uh, it, it affords the same kind of security for group chat, which until a year ago, did, like nobody knew how to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, it, it's called something longer than just double ratchet, but it's double ratchet for group chat. Yeah, like, like, like those, are, those are examples, right? And, and the Bloom filter that, that we did right now gave us this massive reduction. Like, uh, how much was it? A hundred times? A thousand times? Yeah. Uh, so, so, like, from one point of view, sure, these are tricky issues, right? Uh, on the other hand, we keep finding new ways uh, to make things better, right? And, and, and I think like a core responsibility of us is to bring these new developments to as many users as possible out there, right? So, and maybe that's also one of the ideas with status itself, right? That, that it strives to be user-friendly. In fact, um, it's something, it's like my last slide there, like what else is going on at status, right? Uh, it's a big company and we're doing lots of stuff and all kinds of things, but uh, user experience is on my list there, right? And, 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 and our idea of bringing these technologies to users is rooted in this belief that, that, that everybody should have access to these great technologies and maybe have a choice to use more or less privacy and so on, right? But um, that would be my answer to the question. It's not a pure technical answer. It's more like <laughs> we're getting there. Um, so. Last few words, um, I promised Yuri Matthias that's working on the Embarked App Framework. It's an app framework for developing apps. I promised him to tell, him, tell you all that we're supporting Swarm there as well. We're supporting IPFS as well. It's an app framework to develop uh, the apps, basically. It helps you with getting access to the protocols from JavaScript. A uh, little bit similar to what I heard about in the mainframe SDK yesterday. Uh, so you can deploy your DAP to, to Swarm or to IPFS. It has layers for messaging. It has layers for convenient access to other uh, DAP features. Uh, we're building our own Ethereum client for search purposes called Nimbus. It's a new one. Uh, we're going to target it to uh, light devices, right? So light protocols, light, light everything. Uh, hoping to make it kind of modular so we can deploy it both on phones and maybe on custom hardware, uh, mesh network nodes, you name it, right? But it's going to be customizable that way. That's the okay, uh, main selling point. There's Incubate. There's a bunch of other projects going on in Status that I encourage you to, to check out. I'm, I, I think they're pretty exciting. Uh, I've only been in status for a month, and I, and, and I still have a list to go through, like what, what's going on. And then, obviously, with all the all great projects that I've been listening about today, right? So, that's it.